Welcome to Light Shining in Darkness. Then the truth will set you free. You will hear experiences of God's love and guidance. May you be blessed by the Holy Spirit as you listen. Welcome back to Light Shining in Darkness. I'm your host, Otto Morgan, along with Eric Wilson. It's good to see you, Eric. Good morning, Otto. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the emerging church, all the world is one. And we'd like to remind you that we do have an extra time slot on Wednesday at 9 p.m. and still have the Thursday at 11 a.m. So we've been blessed with that extra time slot to give people another chance to hear these messages. Amen. And we'd love to hear your comments and your thoughts or questions. You can leave us a message at 828 692 1190 or email wfhcfm at gmail.com. And we'd like to open up with a word of prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask you to come be with us this morning and give us knowledge and wisdom as we learn things this morning together and that our audience would hear it as well and we'd all be blessed. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Eric, today's world, we're seeing everything kind of come together. Uh, we've been hearing the Pope talk about the common good and just socialist type doctrines and trying to bring everybody together. And there are even t people talking about we won't own any, any property or anything by the year 2030 and th those crazy things that are definitely not what God has taught us and what we've had in, the, in our country, in the world. Otto, you're right because, and it's not just on a religious, but we're seeing that politically, you know, through the United Nations. I mean, think about that. Even the phrase, united, all the nations being joined together as one. If you're joined together as one, you still have to have a head. To any organization, you've got a CEO or you've got a president or a principal, there's always one that has to be the head. There has to be somebody that has the last say and that guides the direction of an organization. So even with, you know, politically, economically, we've seen that, especially over the last 10 years, the entire world is saying we need a one world currency. You know, with the EU, the European Union, you know, where they were working and for a long time and they've still got, you know, that, that currency. But then you've got member states or member countries that are saying, we don't want to operate under your currency. My Italian friends can't stand the European Union. You know, and then we see the same thing is, is happening even with language. I did not realize this until a few years ago when I was able to travel outside this country. And I'm not saying that the English language is any better than any other language. It's probably one of the most, you know, I don't know, it's just not the easiest language. But even in other countries now, English has become almost a primary. When I went to Kenya, everybody there under 30, 35 years old, they're all taught English as the primary language. Their native dialect for their region is secondary. Well, I didn't realize but, that. Yeah. The people that were over 40 or 45, some of them could understand English. They could, they could speak it, but they were not unable to read it. But in all the classrooms, English is taught as primary with reading and writing. And it's happening that way with Japan, with China, a lot of the Spanish-speaking countries. The whole world is being brought together and trying to unify as one. Well, if the prophecy of Daniel interpreted of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and everybody says we're living in the toenails now, and it's copper and That's right. or clay and iron. Is that correct? That is. There's also... You know, other examples in Scripture where the whole world was being brought together. The Tower of Bay at Bible. That's right. And, and when you look at that, what happened back in Genesis, the flood, God had sent the flood to destroy humanity because men were filled with evil and wickedness and probably evil spirits within them causing that. And God said, I have to blot everyone out that's not willing to repent. And only eight people in the entire world were willing to believe and follow and trust God. That's only a, eight. It's amazing. That there were only Out eight. of how many million or millions were alive then. So here we are today, and we're seeing a Tower of Babel 
that's attempting to be rebuilt. Even with the European Union, I've got a poster at home that the European Union put out years ago, and it shows a Tower of Babel, and it says EU, you know, many voices, one tongue, or many voices, one language. So Satan is working really hard right now to bring this about. Well, doesn't it say, as in the days of Noah, so shall the coming that's of the a, That's Son a of good man. point. That's a good point. It's funny, but I think that's in Matthew 24 or Luke 21, where the two chapters most prominently where Jesus talks about the end of this world. And actually, while we're there, if you look in Matthew 24, verse 23, listen to what it says. This is the words of our Savior. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive even the very elect. That's a scary thought for somebody that's just sort of sitting on the middle of the fence. There's going to be such deception in the last days, and the deception is to lead people away from Christ, to lead people away from righteousness, from the Word of God. One of the things that I have found there's a struggle with is that many people that look at prophecy, they look at the Antichrist, which that's not our subject today, but they look at the Antichrist as being, oh, it's going to be this evil man that hates Christianity, and he he hates, you know, anything that looks like Christianity, and he, he's openly against Jesus Christ. But that's not what the Bible says. The word antichrist means one who is in place of, a counterfeit Christ. Jesus said, in the last days, those that are trying to kill God's people are going to think they're doing God a service. So you're not going to have a world that is against God openly professing to be against Christianity, they're going to claim to be Christianity, but yet not following the Word of God. So that's eye-opening. If you can, Otto, let's look at a verse in Revelation chapter 16, because the Apostle John talks about this. Revelation chapter 16, and we're working on a film for this called The Arrival, An Overwhelming Surprise, which just to let you know, uh, our listeners, Otto is also going to be helping us with this documentary. It talks about, here in Revelation 16, looking at verse 12 through 16, in verse 13 it says, And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now, as you were talking about Daniel, the Bible always gives us the definitions for the symbols. We have to search, we have to pray and ask the Lord to lead us, but if God gives us a symbolic figure, you can be assured that the answer, the definition for that figure is also revealed in God's Word. Just like Daniel, you know, he saw these visions, he was like, I don't understand them. God would send Gabriel to come and help him and show him what those symbols were and what they really meant. If we look here, it says in verse 13, I saw three unclean spirits. Remember, these spirits are messengers or messages. I saw three unclean spirits, messengers or messages. Well, that's funny because Revelation 14 talks about three angels' messages going into all the world. Right. So just like God is sending three angels' messages, Satan is sending three of his own messages. It's your counterfeit. That's right. That's right. A counterfeit. And the reason why is because God is preparing his people for his son's return. Satan is preparing a people to stand in defiance against the second coming of Christ. There's two cities all throughout the Bible, Jerusalem, which represents God's people, 
and God's kingdom, and then you have Babylon, which represents Satan's people and Satan's kingdom. So when you look here, it says, these three unclean spirits come out of the mouth of dragon. A spirit is a messenger or a message. It's words. So these messages are coming out of the mouth of the dragon. The dragon, we're given that definition of Satan as being the dragon in Revelation chapter 12. It says, I saw a great red dragon. And on down, in, I think it's verse 8 through 11, it actually identifies who that dragon is, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. The symbol of the dragon is most commonly known in Eastern mysticism, whether it be Chinese mysticism, Japanese, Vietnamese, any of those Eastern religions, Hinduism, even in Hinduism, Hinduism highly lifts up the serpent. I mean, Kundalini Yoga, right. the serpent is lifted up as being God. In Chinese and Japanese, the dragon is lifted up as being the highest spiritual power. Well, both of these are identified in Revelation 12 as being a symbol of Satan and the devil. So it says here, these spirits, these messengers or messages come out of the dragon. That's spiritualism. The dragon is a symbol of Eastern mysticism and spiritualism. They also come out of the mouth of the beast. Daniel tells us that these four beasts are four kings or four kingdoms. And that's found in Daniel chapter 7 onward. A beast always represents a political entity. It's a, a world power. The United States in Revelation 13 is represented as a political power, but it's represented symbolically as a lamb with horns, a lamb-like beast with horns. You look at the Medo-Persian Empire. They were represented in Daniel as being a bear, you know, with three ribs in its mouth. And then you had the lion with eagle's wings, which represented, you know, Babylon. So when we look at the beast, the beast is talking about a political entity. The dragon is representing spiritualism, a spiritual dangerous system, a pagan system. And it says these spirits also come out of the mouth of the false prophet. A prophet always speaks on behalf of God. This is a false prophet. So this is someone who claims to be Christian, but yet they're proclaiming things which are against or contradict the word of God. This is like apostate Christianity or apostate Protestantism. It says here, these are the spirits, verse 14, of devils working miracles. And they go forth to the kings of the whole world and the world for one purpose to deceive them and gather them together as one for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Mm. That's eye-opening, isn't yes, it? Yes, very much so. Let me, uh, I'm going to read a quote to you. This is from a powerful book called The Great Controversy, and this was written, this version, in 1888. Wonderful book. It is. And if our listeners haven't read it, they're... We'll be happy to get you a copy. Amen. Because it's a, a very powerful book. And if it's a larger book, which is funny because I used to tell people, man, I could never read a book that big or Desire of Ages. I mean, it's, you know, close to 600 pages. But yet I know many people will sit down and read a Stephen King novel that's 600 pages and they'll finish it in a weekend. And you're like, how can I finish a Stephen King novel or a fantasy book or a romance novel that's 300 pages in a weekend? and not open up God's Word or other writings from Protestant or, you know, genuine Christians. I just sent that to a friend of mine, and I talked to him about it. He said, oh, this looks like it's going to be a slog, hard <laughs> to read through. And I prayed about it, and within a day of praying about it, he called me and said, this is amazing. Amen. He said, this is, he said, I never knew all these things that the Christians went through. Amen. And the persecution they went through from the Catholic Church. So. And just a word for, of encouragement for our listeners, if you decided, okay, I don't have time to start at the very beginning, even if you go to the last 10 or 12 chapters of the book, if you read the last 10 or 12 chapters of the book, you'll want to go back and read from the beginning, you know, because it goes through something that we're going to talk about hopefully, you know, soon in the future. It goes through the Protestant Reformation. It goes through 
the early church. It goes through all the struggles that went on between the controversy between Christ and Satan. Well, one more thing. If you drive a lot and you want to listen to the great controversy, you can download the app on your phone, EGW2, and look under her writings, and you can download that book, have it narrated for you while you're driving. That's it's really oh, a nice feature neat. from that app, EGW2, on your iPhone or your Android device. So anyway, I want to throw that in. No, I'm glad you did. It's amazing what technology can do for us. Let me, uh, I want to read just a, before I get to that quote from Great Controversy, let me just read a couple of statements here for you. Actually, this one is from Great Controversy. This is page 561. Listen to what we're told. Satan has long been preparing for his final effort to deceive the world, the entire world. The foundation of his work was laid by the assurance that he gave to Eve in Eden. You shall not surely die. For in the days ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing both good and evil. It means you'll be able to discern for yourself good and evil. You won't need God directing you. Little by little, he has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception in the development of spiritualism. He has not yet reached the full accomplishment of his designs but it will be reached in the last remnant of time. So we're told here that Satan began the work of spiritualism in the Garden of Eden. He was speaking through a serpent to Eve, and then he spoke through Eve to her husband Adam. When Eve yielded to the serpent's suggestion, the serpent, the power that was speaking through the serpent now gained access to Eve's life and began speaking through her, even though she didn't realize the words that she were uttering were being inspired by the enemy. Now listen to this. This is from that book we talked about, The Desire of Ages, page 257. So it will be in the great final conflict of the controversy between righteousness and sin. While new life and light and power are descending from on high upon the disciples of Christ, a new life is springing up from beneath, energizing the agencies of Satan. That means giving them power. Intensity is taking possession of every earthly element. With a subtlety gained through centuries of conflict, the prince of evil works under a disguise. Isn't that funny? If Satan had appeared to Eve as the devil, she would have never listened to him. She would have run. But he spoke to her through a creature which back then was beautiful. It was, you know, brilliant with all these scales reflecting all the colors, you know, of, of the Garden of Eden, and it probably had wings. A lot of Bible scholars believe that the serpent originally was winged. You know, I don't have that as a fact, but there's strong indication of that. It's kind of hypnotized you. It is. It is. If you imagine the way that a snake moves, mm -hmm. and if all those scales were reflecting all the brilliance of the light and the flowers, it would be hypnotizing, mesmerizing. It says, with a subtlety, he worked under a disguise. He now appears clothed as an angel of light, and multitudes are giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So Satan is speaking through, like we've talked about in the past, through mysticism and occultism, and he's speaking even through textbooks in our universities and colleges and our high schools. He's speaking, like I tell people, I'm like, you know, if your child is in education and they're bringing home a book that is written by somebody who does not believe in God, a person can only be inspired by one side or the other. If you're not for Christ, you're working against him. So it's through all these different forms that Satan is speaking through these unclean spirits to influence our thoughts and to lead us astray. Now listen to this other quote. This one, this is found in a book called Five Testimonies, page 451. And it's speaking about this last deception. It says, when Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss 
to clasp hands with spiritualism. So I can see Protestantism holding hands with Roman Catholicism. You couldn't have imagined that 20 years ago. I mean, that was a, there's no way. We saw the Roman pontiff a number of years ago actually come and address the United States Congress. If Abraham Lincoln or some of our older presidents had seen that, they would, have, they would roll over in their graves if they were still alive. Right. That was impossible. And then we saw something happen, you know, in the past couple of years with Tony Campolo, where he was addressing, he was there with Kenneth Copeland at this huge, you know, meeting with these professed Protestant evangelicals, and he addressed the Pope, and they united, the entire group united in prayer with the Pope. The reformers would roll over in their They grave. would. You know, yeah. it's so sad, too, because a lot of our brothers and sisters of every denomination, if they would go back and look in their encyclopedias and in their church history books and find out what the founders of their churches actually taught and believed, it would change this world. I just got through reading Romanism and the Reformation by Guinness, phenomenal book uh, to read. And I'm reading another one by, uh, I think it's called uh, Rulers of Evil. Yes. Yeah, by Stassi or some Saucy, somebody like that. An excellent book. It's amazing how far the Protestant churches don't even seem like they're Protestants anymore. I think a lot of them are calling themselves evangelicals, but a true Protestant is knows what that really means. Do you know what's funny? Because even within the Roman Catholic churches, uh, there are many of the conservatives that are really strongly concerned over what they're seeing happen within their church now, where things that 10, 20 years ago were known to be against the Word of God are now being openly accepted and promoted. So we're not against people. Don't think that. We're not talking about that. We're trying to expose things that are leading us astray from the Word of God. So I can see how Protestants can reach over and shake hands with the Roman church. But how do Protestants shake hands with spiritualism? Well, that's what we're getting into with the emerging church. If we accept the teachings that are being given through Rome, and we also begin accepting the teachings that are being brought in through spiritualism and Eastern mysticism, it brings the whole world together as one. Because if you reunite Roman Catholicism with Protestantism, that still leaves the majority of the world out of the picture. The majority of the world is either Buddhist or Hindu. That's your largest spiritual entities out there. The majority of the world. You look at where the world's population is. China and India have got the largest population groups. They're Buddhist or Taoist or Hindu. So how do you get them to come on board and become one? They've got spiritualism. So by holding hands with spiritualism and the Roman power, Protestantism is becoming united in this world movement. And the, the movement is going to lead many to destruction. Let's see here. I think we've got a few more minutes where we can, uh, we can go a little bit farther. Continuing there in Great Controversy, page 588, listen to what it tells us. As spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of our day, it has greater power to deceive and ensnare. Satan himself is converted, it appears, after the modern order of things. He will appear in the character of an angel of light. Wow. That's amazing because this is spiritualism. And you remember the first quote that we read, it said that spiritualism began in the Garden of Eden, but Satan has not yet completed his purpose for spiritualism. So that means from 6,000 years ago, Satan already had a plan. And that plan he has been developing, and now it is coming to fruition. It's being manifest. And we're going to actually see, we are living, all of those that are listening right now, 
we are alive in the day when we are going to see the last great deception. It's which, at the door. That's right. And the last great deception is going to be Satan appearing and claiming to be Christ. That, mm. Yeah, we could do a whole, a whole talk on that. Let me show you how spiritualism is coming in, because with this discussion, we're talking about spiritual formation. Not, not yet, but we're introducing that with the emerging church and emerging Christianity. And you can find a lot of documentaries from men and women of all denominations on YouTube that help reveal this. I'm going to read to you a quote about a book called A Course in Miracles. Do you ever remember reading about that? I studied that. I had a friend in uh, Ecuador that still lives down there. That's his whole life revolved around that book. So I started reading it. It's the most confusing thing. Amen. It is so confusing. I was like, how do you even read this? Do you know that... And I'm talking to our listening audience right now. Every time I come in here with Otto, I am learning new things about him. And I'm thinking, the Lord obviously set this show up because most people say, oh, I've never even heard about that. Or they know reference to Oprah Winfrey. I had no idea that, Otto, you had any involvement with this. Oh, yeah. Wow. I have the book on Kindle, actually. Wow. Well, listen, listen to what it says here. It says this book, it was originally a book format published in 1976 by Dr. Helen Schusman with the help of William Thetford and Judith Scutch. The manuscript was dictated to her by a voice which claimed to be Jesus and began speaking to her in the year 1965 through 1972. So she's hearing a voice that claims to be Jesus. And I'm not saying that God doesn't talk to people, but you have to compare what you're hearing to thus saith the Lord. That's why the Bible tells us in First and Second John, test the spirits whether they be of God. After receiving the first few messages, Dr. Schusman contacted the daughter of renowned psychic Edgar Casey, which that's scary. Edgar Casey was a Sunday school teacher. Uh And he got so many predictions wrong. I know. But he also began receiving something that he called information on how to heal people. And he walked right off the path of righteousness into spiritualism. So she contacted the daughter of Edgar Cayce for advice on what she should do with these teachings that were being given to her. The series called A Course in Miracles was aired worldwide by Oprah Winfrey beginning in January 1, 2008. So, Otto, I'm gonna, I hate to pause right there because we're just now getting to the exciting part. Oh, I know it is getting exciting, but we, we're going to have to close. I guess we'll continue this in part two yes. of the next one. But, we again, we want to thank you, our listeners, for taking the time to listen and remind you that on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, We'll be airing these shows and also the following day, Thursday at 11 a.m. If you have questions or anything you want to ask us or comments, leave us a message at 828-692-1190 or send us an email, wfhcfm at gmail.com. And if we have time, would, would you close in a prayer? Father in heaven, thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way and the truth and the life. Father, thank you for your promise that your spirit will lead us into all truth and that you will keep that which we have committed unto thee against that day. Father, bless all of our listeners and their families and prepare us for that soon day of your son's return in the clouds of glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We hope you were blessed by what you heard today. Remember, we are looking for Jesus' second coming. You can contact us by email, wfhcfm at gmail.com or call 828-692-1190. We welcome your questions or comments.